tonight, we are privileged to have as a keynote speaker, Elder Marlon K. Jensen, who will be addressing us on the topic, May the Kingdom of God Go Forth, That the Kingdom of Heaven May Come. Elder Marlon K. Jensen was named a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on April 1, 1989. He is currently serving in the presidency of the Seventy and as the executive director of the Priesthood Department. He has served in the Utah Central Area Presidency as the president of the Utah North and North America Northeast Areas and as executive director of the Historical and Curriculum Departments. He was president of the New York Rochester Mission from 1993 to 1995. At, at the time of his call as a Seventy, he was serving as a regional representative. Prior to that assignment, he had served in the church as president of the Huntsville Utah Stake, Bishop of the Huntsville Ward, Priest Quorum Advisor, and Elders Quorum President. Elder Jensen previously practiced law in Ogden, Utah, specializing in business and estate planning. He is a partner in a family ranching enterprise. He received his bachelor's degree in German from Brigham Young University and his Juris Doctorate from the University of Utah Law School. He was born in 1942 in Ogden, Utah, and is married to Kathleen Bushnell of Clearfield, Utah. They are the parents of eight children. It is my pleasure to welcome then Elder Jensen to our Sperry Symposium. Elder Jensen. Thank you, Sister Black, for that introduction. My mother wrote that actually several years ago and <laughs> demands that it be read at every opportunity. So thank you for honoring her wishes tonight. I am, though, really very pleased to be with you this evening, capturing the essence of the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints during the 20th century is a rather formidable task. To begin with, there is so much of it, and it is so multifaceted. The Lord's command on the day the Church was organized, that there shall be a record kept among you, has always been taken very seriously by the institutional Church and by many individual members of the Church. Thus, perhaps, no other religion from its earliest beginnings has enjoyed a greater abundance of both primary and secondary sources from which to analyze and reconstruct its history. If, as some of our critics allege, the Prophet Joseph Smith committed a fraud on the world, he certainly made no effort personally and left no instructions to his followers to conceal the evidence. There's another challenge in identifying the true spirit of the Church in the 20th century. It's in striking a balance between the editorial or between the significance of headline events of that time period and the reservoir of goodness that we find in the quiet but rich lives that are lived by individual Latter-day Saints. President Joseph F. Smith once stated the principle this way, quote, those things which we call extraordinary, remarkable, or unusual may make history, but they do not make real life. Thus, the real story of the Church in the 20th century, or in any period of time for that matter, is the real-life story of the struggles, trials, and triumphs of ordinary followers of Christ doing their best as individuals and as a community of believers to walk in His prescribed paths. The best record of much of that aspect of Church history, the personal aspect, is being kept, as one of our hymns reminds us, by angels above who silent notes take. A third and perhaps most significant consideration I have had in mind as I have thought about the Church's history in the 20th century is that by the Lord's own words, the history of this Church is the history of the only true and living Church upon the face of the whole earth. I firmly believe that declaration and thus the exclusive use of the usual secular methods of historical research and analysis are, in my opinion, quite inadequate in capturing the essence of any part of the remarkable spiritual past of our Church. I believe, as Isaiah wrote, that the Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts, nor are His ways our ways. 
I am convinced that the history of the Lord's Church cannot fully be understood nor appreciated without acknowledging the hand of the Lord in all that has occurred and by examining its historical record in that light. A 1904 statement by the Prophet Joseph F. Smith confirms this view and is pertinent today. He said, It has not been the wisdom of man that this people have been directed in their course until the present. It has been by the wisdom of him who is above man, and whose knowledge is greater than that of man, and whose power is above the power of man. For it is unto God, our Father, we are indebted for the mercies we have enjoyed and for the present prosperous condition of the people of God throughout the world. The hand of the Lord may not be, vis be visible to all. There may be many who cannot discern the workings of God's will in the progress and development of this great latter-day work. But there are those who see in every hour and in every moment of the existence of the Church from its beginning until now the overruling almighty hand of Him who sent His only begotten Son into the world. End of quote. Discerning the overruling almighty hand of God in Church history is not always easy. Only He knows the end from the beginning and has all things present before Him. If, we can, if He can make provision for a needed second set of plates hundreds of years before Martin Harris's misfortune, who but the most spiritual knows at any given moment where He may be taking us? My own feeling is that it might be well for us to remember that although God's children are very important to the accomplishment of His purposes, we are often not unlike the young children at an amusement park who drive those little centrally controlled race cars that travel a circular course on a metal rail with their wheels several inches off of the ground. The young, excited drivers furiously pump the gas pedals and spin the steering wheels, fully believing they are having some influence. But the cars go at a speed and in a direction that are largely determined by management. <laughs> Having explained the nature of my historiographic concerns, I proceed now as a non-historian to share some observations about the Church's history in the 20th century. I do so from the vantage point of having lived during nearly 60 of those 100 years and of having had the privilege to serve as a priesthood leader during nearly 40 of them. It has truly been a remarkable and wonderful time to be alive. The first thing that I want to point out about the 20th century is, that, is the interesting contrast between its beginning and its end. In fact, the contrast may be symbolic of one of the most positive things that has happened to the Church in the 20th century. Coming on the heels of the Manifesto and the granting of Utah's statehood, the century began on quite an optimistic note. President Lorenzo Snow was already well along with his signature emphasis on the observance of the law of tithing and of the reduction of Church debt. He had also initiated a revitalized effort to take the gospel to all the world. Public opinion seemed to have shifted from opposition to at least neutrality. This proved to be but a short respite, however, as the Smoot hearings in 1902 revived substantial anti-Mormon sentiment. Negative attitudes toward the Church were heightened by political and journalistic jousting between the uh, LDS and non-LDS populations in Utah. And these were picked up and amplified by the national and European presses so that the Church and its beliefs were again closely scrutinized and vilified in many parts of the world. It is perhaps not coincidental that during this renewed period of suspicion and ill will, in the ninth year of the administration of President Joseph F. Smith, a baby boy named Gordon Bittner Hinckley was born on the 23rd of June 1910 in Salt Lake City as the first child of Bryant S. and Ada Bittner Hinckley. With the expectancy of U.S. males at that time being 50 years, no one would have expected the spindly and frail boy to exceed that norm by at least 40 years, and we hope many more. 
and for him to be instrumental in leading the church at the end of the 20th century into its most sustained period of public understanding and acceptance. But President Gordon B. Hinckley has certainly done that and much, much more. I think all of us are aware and justifiably pleased that the church has experienced tremendous growth in the past century. There were only 268,000 members of the church in 1900 and nearly 11 million by the century's end. It remained for a non-member sociologist, however, Dr. Rodney Stark of the University of Washington to tell the world just how phenomenal LDS growth patterns have been. He rocked the boat, literally, of religious sociologists in 1984 by characterizing Mormonism as the rise of a new world faith and by project projecting future membership to be 60 million people by the year 2080 if a growth rate of 30% could be sustained. Based on our historical record of growth, this is a very reasonable expectation. By way of follow-up, and perhaps to refute critics of his 1984 projections, Dr. Stark published a second essay in 1996 entitled, So Far So Good, <laughs> a brief assessment of Mormon membership projections. He noted with satisfaction that in 1995, church membership exceeded his 1984 estimates by almost a million members. While such growth is something for which we should be very grateful and reflects the vitality and appeal of the LDS way of life, President Hinckley constantly reminds us that management of worldwide growth is our biggest challenge. With more members now living outside the United States than within, and with Spanish on a course to become the predominant language spoken by church members in the next 25 years, we have our work cut out for us. But the prospects are exciting. Something else that has impressed me as I have reflected on the significance of the 20th century is that with an additional 100 years, the church has now existed long enough to have a rather extensive track record. Although 170 years is a comparatively short period of time for a religious movement to grow and mature and for the benefits of its ideology to be reflected in the lives of its adherents, substantial evidence now exists that obedience to the covenants and ordinances of the restored gospel contributes significantly to a happy, healthy, and productive way of life. This fact comports with the test announced by the Savior for distinguishing true prophets from false ones. We are to know them by their fruits. A very tangible fruit of the restored gospel, which has become especially apparent during the 20th century, is the care provided by the church to the poor and needy. Beginning formally with the institution of the welfare program in 1936, the church has encouraged self-reliance on the part of its members and has taught and followed basic welfare principles for providing the necessities of life for needy members. No one can visit the central bishop storehouse in Salt Lake City and see the variety of foodstuffs and other household and clothing goods produced at welfare projects located all over the world and not stand in awe of the generosity of the Latter-day Saints and the genius of a program which permits us to help one another in the Lord's own way. In the last 15 years, church resources have also permitted an outreach to people of all faiths and nations in extending humanitarian aid. This service has touched 146 nations through thousands of projects involving the delivery of tons of clothing, food, medical equipment and supplies, educational materials, and millions of dollars in cash. The Church has assisted those in distress from war, earthquake, flood, drought, and other disasters. The Church's commitment to the education of the intellect as well as the spirit has produced other notable gospel fruits. Gospel doctrines encourage Church members to educate their total beings toward greater temporal and spiritual independence, character values, and social conscience. An interesting evidence of this commitment is a study that shows that the more educated Latter-day Saints are, the more religious they become. The positive trend runs counter to society in general. The health code embodied in the Word of Wisdom has also resulted in measurable benefits to those who obey its principles. Latter-day Saints live appreciably longer lives and have significantly lower levels of cancer, heart disease, 
and other serious medical conditions. Spiritual blessings also accrue, including an increase in knowledge, capacity, and peace of mind. In this connection, I can't help parenthetically quoting one of our critics who, in reference to the self-discipline and self-denial required by the word of wisdom, once quipped that Mormons don't really live longer. It just seems like it. <laughs> Latter-day Saints also have an exemplary record of family life, and Latter-day Saint homes face a lower incidence of prob problems plaguing society generally. Divorce rates among Latter-day Saints married in a temple are very low, a stark contrast to broader statistics. The rate of teen pregnancies, abortions, and children born out of wedlock is low as well. There are fewer single-parent homes, and the attendant juvenile delinquency associated with fatherless families. Crime and substance abuse among Latter-day Saints fall below the norm as well. A fruit or byproduct of gospel living I particularly appreciate is the opportunity for personal involvement provided by a church organization that hath need of every member. There is something wonderful about the personal growth and fulfillment experienced by church members who labor without pay in providing the leadership, teaching, and concern for the welfare of others, which are hallmarks of this church. The spirit of this unique system is epitomized for me each time I see President Hinckley taking his wallet out of his pocket and paying for his own lunch in the modest little lunchroom at church headquarters where the general authorities eat each day. I often think to myself that as long as that practice persists, we have nothing to fear. It certainly proves that in the kingdom of God, there is no aristocracy. In enumerating some of the fruits of the restored gospel, <clears throat> which become more and more apparent the longer the church exists, I don't mean to appear boastful. I fully realize that some of the most desirable outcomes of gospel living can't be quantified or measured. There are certainly many areas in which we continue to struggle and fall short, depending on our individual application of gospel principles. Nevertheless, I think it's safe to say that in the past century, <clears throat> The collective goodness and accomplishment of church members is something of which the rest of the world has begun to take notice, even if begrudgingly in some quarters. A conversation I had on a plane flight from Detroit to Toronto several years ago with an Arizona businessman captures the perception I think is out there in the minds of many not of our faith and helps explain the goodwill toward the church and its members which now exists across the world. As I entered the plane that day, I introduced myself to my seatmate and after a little small talk asked him to tell me about his family. He affectionately des described his wife and children and then politely asked me about mine. I showed him a small photo I carry and did my best to share my feelings about people in my life I love the most. The spirit at that point was so good I decided to share briefly the truths contained in the first missionary discussion. I talked of our belief in a loving Heavenly Father of his plan of happiness, and of its restoration through the prophet Joseph Smith. I shared my testimony of the Book of Mormon and the role of the Holy Ghost in finding truth. The man seemed genuinely interested, and so I courageously inquired if I might have two missionaries call on him at his home in Phoenix. <clears throat> Without hesitation, he replied with a resounding, No, I don't want that. <clears throat> I recoiled with some surprise, and our conversation at that point went dead. I felt embarrassed and was angry with myself for being overly aggressive. I retreated to my newspaper, and he began working on his laptop computer. As the plane landed in Toronto, I wondered what I might say in parting to smooth the situation over. Before I could gather my wits, this fine gentleman said, Mr. Jensen, before you go, I, want, I have something I want to say to you. I thought to myself, here it comes, but gave him my full attention. You are the third Mormon man I have sat next to on an airplane in the last 18 months, he said. <laughs> and you are all alike. <clears throat> How is that, I gently inquired. You all talk about your families, he said, and you all believe deeply in your religion. Then, I, then he said something that I will never forget. There must be something right about Mormonism. There is much that is right about Mormonism. 
And one of the unmistakable lessons of the 20th century for which we need to be very grateful is that the world is beginning to realize just that. In a world of shifting values, and in some cases no values at all, the eternal truths upon which the, the gospel is based have positioned the church in the last century to be an anchor in a sea of change. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the church's efforts throughout the 20th century to safeguard the institution of the family as the basic unit of the church and of society. Continuing concern for serious challenges to marriage and family led the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in 1995 to take the unusual step of issuing to the entire world a proclamation on the subject of the family. In nine powerful paragraphs, the Lord's standard and will concerning marriage, relationships, and family life were unequivocally set forth. I feel this inspired and boldly worded document will stand for generations to come as a prophetic and definitive statement on the family and its place in God's plan. In prospecting through 100 years of the Church's history, one forms the distinct impression that, in a sense, the history of the Church in any era is the history of its acting prophet, president. Holding and exercising all the keys of the priesthood, the prophet rightfully enjoys a position of great resp uh, respect and influence. As the Church was organized, the saints were admonished by the Lord concerning the prophet to, quote, give heed unto all his words and commandments, close quote. History records that, by and large, the repeal of Prohibition in 1933 being a notable exception, that the saints have obediently heeded their prophet's counsel. This has resulted in great blessings for individual members and for the institutional church. Another impressive manifestation of the prophetic mantle has been the ability of the prophets as seers to peek around the corners of the future. This dimension of a prophet's powers was described by Nephi as he explained to his brothers that by the Spirit are all things made known unto the prophets, which shall come upon the children of men according to the flesh. Through the years, the inspired declarations and teachings of the prophets have provided guidance to the saints for the avoidance of worldly pitfalls and have often positioned the Church and its membership to proactively prepare for conditions that at the time were yet unforeseen. I hope you won't mind my sharing a personal experience in this regard. In 1997, Elder W. Eugene Hansen and I were asked to host the Honorable Michael Moore, Mississippi's Attorney General, during a brief visit he made to Utah and to Church headquarters. In a wide-ranging conversation with Mr. Moore, Elder Hansen and I raised questions about the lawsuit he had filed against the major American tobacco companies on behalf of the state of Mississippi. We knew Mississippi had recovered a sizable judgment and that other states, including Utah at the time, were then undertaking similar action. We asked him specifically upon what legal theory the state of Mississippi's claim had been based. Much to our surprise, Mr. Moore informed us that the state's cause of action had been based on a theory of conspiracy, which the evidence eventually conclusively showed existed among the tobacco companies and even among their lawyers. As Mr. Moore talked of his conspiracy theory and the efforts made by the tobacco companies to hide from the public the addictive and harmful effects of tobacco, my mind almost instinctively turned to Section 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants. A copy of that scripture was quickly located, and after briefly explaining the background and import of Section 89, I asked Mr. Moore to read verse 4. We listened attentively as he slowly and deliberately read that verse out loud in his appealing Southern accent, which I won't try to duplicate. The verse reads, Behold, verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days. I have warned you and forewarned you by giving unto you this word of wisdom by revelation. The scriptural reference to conspiring men was not lost on Mr. Moore. As he finished reading verse 4, a broad smile came across his face, and with a twinkle in his eye, he said, I never dreamed in visiting Utah I would find 10 million Mormons who would agree with my conspiracy theories. 
My heart burned within me that day and has many times since as I have thought about Joseph Smith's gifts as a prophet and seer. There is really no other explanation for the origin of that 1833 revelation. It waited until nearly the end of the 20th century for an almost literal public verification of one of its key passages. However, in the hearts of the faithful saints who have heeded its message for nearly 170 years, there has never been any doubt about its authenticity or relevance. The truth of the principle this anecdote illustrates, that prophets know beforehand through the Spirit what is going to befall mankind, was borne out again and again during the course of the Church's development in the 20th century. President Lorenzo Snow's revelation regarding tithing, for example, not only brought the Church out of the fiscal bondage it was in at the start of the century, it also helped to lay the firm foundation, financially speaking, on which the rapidly growing Church would eventually keep up with the demand for the construction of new meeting houses, provide for an expanding educational system, support a worldwide missionary effort, and finance the building of temples and family history work at an unprecedented rate. Anyone who doubts the inspired financial course on which President Snow set the Church needs only to talk today with leaders of other denominations whose constant concern and focus are the raising of money. Tithing truly is the Lord's law of finance, and we need to gratefully acknowledge its blessings in our personal lives as well as for the Church as an institution. Stressing the importance of the home and the responsibility of parents to teach their children the gospel is another area where prophetic foresight is traceable throughout the past century. In 1915, President Joseph F. Smith and his counselors urged the inauguration of a weekly home evening throughout the Church, during which time fathers and mothers were to gather their families and to teach them the gospel. I am certain no social scientist of that early time could have foreseen the tremendous decline in the institutions of marriage and family that would occur in the second half of the 20th century. But through revelation, a prophet could and did. Other prophets who followed, particularly President David O. McKay, had similar insights and shared their own unique encouragement and warnings regarding home and family. Those who have heeded their inspired counsel have been blessed in accordance with the original promise of President Smith and his counselors nearly a hundred years ago. Love at home and obedience to parents will increase. Faith will be developed in the hearts of the youth of Israel, and they will gain power to combat the evil influences and temptations which beset them. What I have pointed out about the prophetic perspective on the future concerning the word of wisdom, tithing, and family home evening could be said with equal force of the Book of Mormon, the Temple, and the retention of new converts all themes on which our three most recent prophets have dwelt. Each of these prophetic points of emphasis in its own way is undoubtedly as important a message for the Latter-day Saints as was Noah's five-day forecast regarding a certain impending storm for the Saints of his day. Based on the course of the Church's history in the 20th century, we ought to sing We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet with even greater fervor than we do. Any commentary on the Church's history in the 20th century must include mention of the momentous 1978 revelation, which extended priesthood and temple blessings to all worthy male members of the Church without regard for race or color. For all of us old enough to remember the June 9th announcement that year, it will always remain a, mo <coughs> a joyous moment, frozen in time. I especially treasure one of the unwritten acts of the Apostles reported to have occurred following the temple meeting in which the revelation was received. Apparently, while walking back to his office with some of his brethren, President Marion G. Romney expressed gratitude that now, for the first time, truly, every man can speak in the name of God, the Lord. Equally as important to the Church and, and its future are the organizational changes which have been made to the quorums of the 70 since 1975. Beginning modestly with the organization of the first quorum of the 70 in that year, a gradual unfolding of priesthood government has taken place, including the assimilation of the assistants to the 12th into the first quorum of 70 in 1976, 
the, implement, the implementation of area presidencies in 1984, the dissolution of stake 70s quorums in 1986, the creation of the second quorum of 70 in 1989, and the creation of the Office of Area Authority 70 and three additional quorums of 70 in 1997. Today there are 276 members of the 70 who help supervise the work of the church under the direction of the Quorum of the Twelve throughout the world. The organization is now in place to govern the church in the exciting and challenging years of growth and expansion that lie ahead. An experience I had as a newly called 70 will il illustrate a point I would like to make about the role of the scriptures in the church during the past century. I, along with 11 other men, was called as a 70 in April of 1989. The first orientation session we all attended was conducted by Elder Marion D. Hanks, who was then one of the seven presidents of 70. As the meeting began, I noticed I had forgotten to bring my scriptures, but felt my oversight would go unnoticed. This was a blessing I was denied, however, <laughs> as early in the meeting Elder Hanks called on me to read a passage from the Doctrine and Covenants. When he saw that I was groping for my neighbor's scriptures, Elder Hank said, Brother Jensen, do you own a set of scriptures? <laughs> I do, I replied. They are unfortunately in my office. Why don't, why don't you go get them? Elder Hanks asked. In the most self-conscious moment of my life, I dashed to my office, retrieved my scriptures, and returned to the meeting room. As I tried inconspicuously to take my seat, Elder Hanks, in his best Brooklyn accent, said, Brother Jensen, when you come to church, you better bring the books. <laughs> I have done that unfailingly ever since, <laughs> and I am not alone in observing that practice. In the past 20 years, particularly, there has been a tremendous surge of interest in personal scripture study and in the use of the scriptures in teaching and speaking about the gospel. The publication of the Latter-day Saint edition of the scriptures beginning in 1979 undoubtedly gave impetus to this very healthy trend. It has been enhanced by President Benson's encouragement regarding the Book of Mormon and by the correlation in a four-year cycle of the youth and adult curriculum, Sunday curriculum, using the scriptures as the foundation. A thrilling sight each Sunday everywhere in the world is the great number of Latter-day Saints of all ages carrying their scriptures to and from church. The resultant increase in gospel scholarship and faith has made this development one of the crowning achievements of the past century. Any study of Christianity in the closing decades of the 20th century will indicate that there has been a crisis in what is called Christology, the doctrine of Christ's work and his person. Relativism and historical skepticism have led many to doubt the truth regarding Christ's person and mission. The work of Robert Funk's so-called Jesus Seminar in recent years is one example of this very regrettable trend. He and his scholarly associates have classified all of the sayings and deeds attributed to Jesus into categories, four categories actually, certainly inauthentic, probably inauthentic, certainly, excuse me, probably authentic, and certainly authentic. Decisions regarding classification were made by a majority vote of the seminar members. In contrast to this lamentable state of affairs stand the strong testimonies of our Savior which have been borne unfailingly by God's chosen prophets and apostles throughout the past century. This consistent witness is at the very heart and soul of this Church. On the first day following the close of the 20th century, January 1, 2000, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles commemorated the birth of Jesus Christ two millennia ago by issuing to the world their collective testimony of the living Christ. Among other inspiring assertions in a beautifully worded document, these fifteen committed men testified that Christ's life, which is central to all human history, neither began in Bethlehem nor concluded on Calvary. He was the firstborn of the Father, the only begotten Son in the flesh, the Redeemer of the world. It is a fact of history in this Church in the 20th century that such a ringing conviction of the reality of our Savior's birth, death, and atoning sacrifice 
has been carried in the hearts of literally millions of Latter-day Saints. With the current prophets and apostles, we join in saying, God be thanked for the matchless gift of His divine Son. I conclude my remarks concerning the Church in the 20th century by humbly admitting my inability to do justice to the topic at hand. The kingdom of God on earth in any age defies total comprehension and analysis by man. It is God's work, and He alone knows its heights and depths. Only with the help of the Holy Ghost, who gives life and meaning to all that we do, can we ever hope to fully understand and appreciate all that God has provided for us. Only with the help of the Spirit can we come to know not just what has happened in our remarkable history, but more importantly, why it happened and what God's intentions and designs for each of us are. Nevertheless, he has said he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets, and they in turn have often shared these secrets in the form of prophecies. The Church's course over the last 100 years unquestionably fulfills prophecy. For example, Israel is in the process of being gathered. 60,000 incredible young missionaries are evidence of this as they preach the gospel in all the world for a witness unto all nations. A significant part of this gathering involves bringing God's elect to the temple and the covenants and ordinances to be found there. Thus the importance of President Hinckley's small temple initiative in bringing the temple to the people cannot be overstated. His name will, be, will rightfully be enshrined in the history of the final years of the 20th century and the beginning years of the 21st century as the greatest temple-building president of all time. Jacob shall flourish in the wilderness is another prophecy. Who can doubt that the descendants of Jacob who settled this great basin kingdom have flourished? The Lamanites shall blossom as a rose. Father Lehi's descendants from North, Central, and South America and the Isles of the Sea are joining the Church in large numbers and are making progress in other important ways. My wife and I just returned from Tonga where I learned for the first time in my life that 40 percent of the population of Tonga is Latter-day Saint. And I've never found any place on earth really where the Church is stronger than it is there. The hearts of the children are being turned to their fathers and the hearts of fathers to their children. From Elijah in the Kirtland Temple to www.familysearch.org, progress in genealogical and temple work has been remarkable. The name of Joseph Smith shall be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues. This prophecy would be nothing but an idle boast from a presumptuous teenager were it not for the fact that it has been literally fulfilled. The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. This prophecy is being fulfilled in this very moment as the Church continues to grow and spread across the earth. It's interesting to me that President Hinckley has referred to Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream frequently in these beginning years of his administration. Where do we now stand as we leave the 20th century and begin another? In his magnificent October 1999 conference address, President Gordon B. Hinckley said, We stand on the summit of the ages. What can one see from that summit as a new millennium dawns? To be sure, one sees great possibilities as well as great challenges. There will be unbelievable advancements in technology, bioengineering, medicine, and pharmacology. There will be a continuing decline of values and morals, and the family will be under determined attack. Secularization will increase as faith in God wanes, and the idea of absolute truth surrenders to notions of tolerance and relativism. In the midst of it all, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will continue its onward march. The Prophet Joseph eloquently, eloquently declared in the Wentworth letter that no unhallowed hand could stop the work from progressing, and it has not. That the truth of God would go forth boldly, nobly, and independent and it has, and it will. I testify that God lives, 
that Jesus is his living son, that through the prophet Joseph, the kingdom of God has been restored to earth. With all of you, I pray that we will help God's kingdom to go forth, that the kingdom of heaven may come. This I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.